This week's topic is radiographic anatomical landmarks. The anatomy is referred to as landmarks because they provide a way to orient the viewer to what he or she is looking at in a radiograph. So what are the landmarks? They include dental anatomy, the periodontium, osteology in the maxilla, and osteology in the mandible. This information will be provided in two parts. The first part will consider dental and periodontal anatomy. Let's start with dental anatomy. Dental anatomy is something you are very familiar with. Uh, you're very familiar with enamel, dentin, pulp canals, dentino enamel junction, and you'd be able to identify these parts, I'm sure, on a tooth. What we need to do is become just as familiar with how these anatomical parts appear radiographically. So think about what's radiopaque, what would be radiopaque, and what would be radiolucent. Uh, start by applying what you know about x-rays and the way they penetrate objects and affect the film on the other side of the object. The tissues that have more density or mass are going to block more rays and therefore the image representing that will appear more radiopaque before, because fewer rays get to the film. So if you're thinking about enamel, it's a fairly dense substance, so it is going to appear quite radiopaque. You can mick it out here on the crowns of these teeth. You can also see the dentin um, underneath the enamel and the point at which the dentin becomes enamel. So that's your dentino-enamel junction. Notice when you come down to the root of the tooth, you see dentin slash cementum. The reason you really don't see a demarcation between the cementum, which is the outer covering of the root, and the dentin is because they, they for the most part, have the same thickness to them. They, they have the same mass and density. So the x-rays penetrate them in the same way. So even though we don't see the distinction, we do know that the cementum is present um, if, <clears throat> if the bone is there in place. The other an anatomy are the pulp canals or the pulp horns. You see the pulp canal or the pulp chamber and the, and the chamber here within the tooth and that would be said to be radiolucent. It is um, a space rather than a, a, an object and or a material and in that space is soft tissue, blood vessels, nerve tissue. So the x-rays penetrate that area more readily and they appear darker or more radiolucent on the um, crown of the tooth. Let's take a closer look at the pulp cavity. Uh, as you know, there's a pulp horn for each cusp, but because the facial and lingual cusp, cusps or horns are superimposed on one another, on a radiograph it appears there are only two, but we know um, from our dental and oral anatomy that there are four, one for each cusp on a, <clears throat> on a molar. Also, um, the pulp canal, there's one for each root with one exception. If you recall the mesial root of tooth number 19 and 30, the mandibular first molars, even though there's only one mesial root, they, there are two root canals. It's almost as if the tooth intended to have two roots on the mesial but never got around to finishing it. So the, the, it does have two root canals um, and sometimes you can see them when they're not directly superimposed on one another. <clears throat> In addition, you'll sometimes see accessory canals um, in the apical one half of the root. I'm not seeing any in particular here, but you'll want to look on the films that you take in lab on patients and the patients you see in clinic to see what you see, if you can see those branching off the root at times. Another thing about pulp chambers is that there can be some variety in the size and shape of them. 
when you're looking at radiographs on children, you're going to see that the canals are larger and more distinct. Take a look at the, how thick these canals appear. And these look relatively large chambers. Um, <clears throat> when you compare that to an adult, which is a picture down here, they have smaller pulp chambers and less, less well defined because of secondary dentin gets laid down over the years. So it becomes, the tooth structure becomes more and more thick. So you don't see the, the pulp chamber as much. <clears throat> and on a child the pulp horns will be more distinguishable too for that very reason. We know this is a younger person here because of the the distinct pulp horns and if you look back here the third molar has not erupted yet and has not fully formed. You see um, the crown has started to form but there are no no roots to the tooth as yet. Which brings us to um, thinking about the stages in development of a tooth. And you can also witness that radiographically. <clears throat> These can help you assess the, the age of the patient. Um, you'll sometimes see a tooth germ. The tooth germ is the, the area where a tooth will occur prior to calcification. So it's very well defined round oval radiolucency. This is an example of a tooth germ right here. And if that stood alone, it would be hard to tell what it was. Um, you might think it was a cyst in the bone. But with this other information here, where you see a mandibular first molar developing, the roots are not completely formed. You see the crown calcifying on the mandibular second molar. Same thing with the mandibular second premolar. <clears throat> so this must be the tooth germ for the mandibular third molar. Also to take in to note is crown development. Um, calcification of the crown begins at the crown tip and works ap <clears throat> excuse me, apically. <clears throat> um, and you see a radiopaque um, crown developing within the radiolucency of the tooth germ. You start to see the root development as well. Um, and initially you see very wide canals. And if you look down at this film, those wide canals diverge and get thicker at the apex. That's not typical of a completed, completely formed root. So this is still in progress. Um, which indicates this is a younger patient. Um, the ideal crown to root ratio is generally one to one and a half. So the length of the root tends to be one and a half times the length of the crown of the tooth. And that can help you assess whether the tooth is fully formed or whether it has a ways to go or whether there's resorption present, a number of things. The periodontia. We'll look now, we looked at the teeth and the teeth, tooth structures and move from the teeth now to the supporting structures. So those supporting structures include the alveolar bone and the alveolar bone is made up of both cancellous bone which we call trabecula on the radiograph and lamina dura. <clears throat> so the trabecula is that spongy looking bone it's the cancellous bone, and the lamina dura is the lining of the tooth socket that cribriform plate will look at. Also, the, uh, we see the periodontal ligament, um, which is the radiolucent line that surrounds the tooth and attaches the root of the tooth to the uh, lamina dura. Nutrient canals can sometimes be visualized. They're viewed right here as little radiolucent dots. Um, you see them where the bone is thinner. They're not always observable, but they're always there, bringing blood to the area. <clears throat> so we'll take a closer look at the lamina dura. <clears throat> the lamina dura um, is the wall of the tooth socket. It's also it's made up of cortical bone and sometimes referred to as the cribriform plate. So this radiopaque line surrounding the root of the tooth is your tooth socket or your lamina dura. 
also want to study the alveolar crest interdentally between the teeth and the septal bone. It should be continuous with the lamina dura. Ideally, in, in good health, the lamina dura will come up and pass over the crest of the bone and go down into the next tooth area. Um, you may notice um, it appears slightly less radiopaque than the rest of the lamina dura, but nevertheless, uh, look for that as a sign of health. Again, if there's been no bone loss, you should see the lamina dura at approximately 1.5 to 2 millimeters apical to the CEJ. So you take, you try to look use your magnifying glass and look for the where the enamel ends and the cementum begins and you could use a probe to measure down to see if that's one and a half to two millimeters looks like it to me so it looks like there's no bone loss right here you will see variations in the lamina dura um, around the tooth due to the tooth morphology um, the thickness density uh, the detail according to the shape of the root. For example, <clears throat> um, if the tooth is thicker facio-lingually, the lamina dura will appear more radiopaque. If it's uh, more rounded, less thickness, it appears less radiopaque. Take a look over here. We'll use this premolar as an example. You'll notice on the distal of this premolar, the lamina dura looks quite distinct. You can Oops, hang on. Look, uh, looks quite distinct. You can see it running right down the distal portion of this root. And you can see it here on the mesi... I guess this is oversensitive today. I apologize. <clears throat> um, if you look at the mesial of the root, you see the lamina dura there, but it's less distinct. Now the reason for that is the shape of that root. If I were to cut off that root and tip it on its side, so we're looking at a cross section this way, let me orient you. This is the root itself. The black represents the periodontal ligament around the root and then the white around that is the lamina dura or the cribriform plate of the tooth socket. So if your x-rays were coming from this direction and you had a film behind the tooth, notice what the x-rays would have to go through. On the distal, if this, this would be the distal in my drawing here, the x-ray is going through cancellous bone here, but now it comes in counter with a thicker cortical bone, and it has to travel farther through that thicker cortical bone to finally arrive at the film. Well, that's going to block out more radiation, and the lamina dura is going to appear more radiopaque there. On the mesial of that same tooth, because of its rounded design, the x-ray is penetrating much uh, looser bone here. Uh, the, the alveolar bone, the trabeculi. It encounters the thicker cortical bone for just a short period and then goes through the looser bones. So fewer x-rays will be blocked and so the uh, lamina dura on the mesial of that tooth <clears throat> will appear less radiopaque. That doesn't mean there's something wrong with the tooth. You just have to think back to what your tooth morphology is and see if you can make sense of, of why it appears that way. When we're looking at the periodontal ligament, um, we're technically talking about the periodontal ligament space. Because we're talking about uh, soft tissue, it's uh, fibrous connective tissue, um, the x-rays penetrate that. So it actually, the x-rays go right through that and, and cause more of a latent image on the film. The ligament is normally continuous around the root with uniform thickness. <clears throat> and you look at that, you can see that on each of these slides. There are normal variations in, um, the, f in the shape of the periodontal ligament too. The same principles apply. For example, you may, if you have a broad, flat root surface facio-lingually, the ligament will appear more radiolucent. If it's a rounded surface, less radiolucent due to more bone. And again, 
you may see that occurring here. You see more of the ligament here than you do here. And now look at what's happening. Now the x-rays are passing through the soft tissue and less bone. So it'll appear, be appearing uh, more radiolucent. Here it's um, passing through more bone on either side of this little bit of ligament and appears more less radiolucent. Another variation you may see with the periodontal ligament is something we call a double periodontal ligament. That's it's just a term for it. Technically it's not a double periodontal ligament. But when a root has a very irregular shape the way a mandibular first molar does, um, that was the tooth we mentioned that has a, a, a dumbbell type shape or a kidney bean type shape. It has the two roots uh, root canals even though there's just one root. Because of the shape of that, sometimes the way the x-rays pass through that can sometimes record what appears to be two periodontal ligament spaces. So you, the diagram here shows you again how the x-rays are penetrating and I'll find my way back and how that can be recorded on the on the root of the tooth. So here you're seeing one aspect of the periodontal ligament and here you're seeing another. Um, it's more or less an optical illusion or the way it appears radiographically. The trabecular patterns in the bone is also interesting to note. This can help you with your mounting of your films and help orient you. In the mandible, the cancellous bone, the trabecular pattern runs very horizontally and looks looser. It's more, uh, and there are more obvious spaces in between the bone. If you look at this example, it just those areas or radiopaque areas tend to run in a horizontal fashion that is typical of mandibular. Uh, alveolar bone. Whereas in the maxilla, the cancellous bone is overall appearance is more radiopaque and more lacy, with less with that linear appearance. So if you didn't have the teeth in these films, you should still be able to orient yourself to thinking this is from the maxilla, this is from the mandible. One more thing to look at in terms of anatomy, we mentioned the nutrient canals and they can be hard to see but we do know they're there. They supply the teeth and the interdental areas with, with nutrients. Um, they're observed where bo the bone is thinner. They're more easily observed, observed even though they're everywhere. So in the mandible the bone tends to be thinner and in areas where there are fossa we tend to see them more. So I'll point to a few little dots, radiolucent dots. Um, they're dots because they're little chambers or canals where the blood vessels come through, so there's less bone in that area. <clears throat> Edentulous areas, um, sometimes you'll see a little bit of a remnant, depending upon how long it's been since the extraction occurred, um, you'll see a remnant of the uh, laminadora that was the lining of the tooth so circuit. After a period of time that compact bone does resorb and the socket fills with cancellous bone. So this is not uh, an extraction that happened just recently but within um, probably a year or so ago it would be my estimation. Let's see if we can use this information. It's fun to try to figure out how old somebody is by their radiographs. Here are a few hints when you look at this bite wing. <clears throat> are the pulp chambers readily visible when you look at them in this area, this area, this area? Do you see any developing tooth buds? Yes, there's something developing here. Looks like there may be something developing here and even here and here. Do you see any differences in the root structure among these molars? For example, um, these teeth to me look, the roots look more flared in this way. Here they're more straight. Um, that's typical of deciduous teeth versus permanent teeth. So if you can get yourself oriented, this is, this is a 
these are both permanent molars and these are deciduous second and first molars. So obviously, whoops, obviously um, this is a mixed dentition and you'd have to use your dental anatomy to try to figure out how old this patient is. Clearly they're more than six years old because the first molars erupt around six. We have a developing um, second molar here but we still have a deciduous second and <clears throat> first in the mouth. The premolars generally erupt, do you recall, around 10 to 11 for the first and 10 to 12 for the second. So if you thought this patient was around 9 years old, I'd say you were probably pretty close to being right. I would put this patient at about 9. Let's take a no look at another. How old is this individual? Again, note the large pulp chambers in 23 through 26. And look at the incomplete apices in these four teeth. <clears throat> Do you see any developing tooth buds? Here's a developing tooth bud and here's a developing tooth bud. Um, also, a little hint is the periodontal ligament will remain very thick for six months or more after the apex appears complete. So let's think, how old would this patient be? Um, when do the roots complete on the mandibular lateral and central? If you look that up or if you remember from uh, dental anatomy, you'll re be reminded that the root complete around 9 to 10 years old. They start to erupt around 6 or 7, but it takes some time for the rest of the tooth to develop. The mandibular canines, which are these tooth developing tooth buds, um, erupt somewhere between 9 and 10 years old. So this patient isn't 9 years old yet, but they're definitely more than 6 or probably 7. I would say this patient is probably close to eight years old when you think that root formation on these anteriors won't occur until nine to ten. So um, how did you do with that?